Good morning, and welcome to the services for the Lake Merced Church of Christ here in San Francisco, California. It's beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. We are so, so grateful to spend this time with you. Today's a special day. It's a day that we're going to spend to honor moms and to honor who they are before God. And so we're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, two questions to ask for you. Number one, if you are watching us on Facebook and you have not liked the Lake Merced Church of Christ page, would love for you to do that. Or if you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to us there. And second, wherever you are, if you would click that share button right now, maybe there's a mom, a grandma, a great grandma, whoever, who would love to hear a message to encourage her and uplift her right now. I know these are difficult times. We're all stressed, we're all a little anxious. It's a great day to be lifted up and encouraged about who we are, who moms are in God's eyes. And uh, we're just so grateful to have you here with us this morning. God bless you. Let's stand, let's worship God, let's make Him the object of our affection and love. Let's, let's worship, church. Hello, my name is Alyssa. My mom sacrifices her time to take care of me. Hi, my name is Tiffany, and the greatest sacrifice that my mom made for me was um, being a young mom. She had to she had to relinquish most of her young life to be my mom, and I think that as a young mom myself, I didn't recognize that kind of sacrifice that she was that she was asked to give um, until I became a young mom myself, and how much I appreciate and love her for that. Hello, my name is Amelia, and my mom sacrificed her time to help me with my school. I, I don't know the most, the most sacrificially loving thing my mom ever did for me, but the one I do know about that made an impression on me at a young age was when I found out that when times were tough and we couldn't afford to, uh, my mom was taking her jewelry and she was pawning it off so that I could play sports, football, baseball, and so on. And uh, I'll never forget the impression that made on me. So thank you, Mom, for, for the sacrificial love that you showed me and put me first. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. My mom worked in the same office building for 27 years. She commuted one hour each way on the bus, and she didn't even really like the job, but she did it because it was what was best for her family. And I know she got it from her mom growing up in the Philippines, where her mom would go out every day and sell fish to the neighbors just so they can make enough money to buy some food to, to survive. I'm thankful for these women. My name is Michelle and the time my mom sacrificed for me is when she had me at a young age and took care of me. Hi, I'm Kristen, that's Audrey, and that's my mom Gwen. And we're talking about how self-sacrificial my mother was growing up. I remember her spending countless hours, even though she was a single mom and likely exhausted, uh, just sewing these beautiful dresses for my school performances. Um, and another thing was when I was about 10 years old, she presented a paint palette to me and had me pick out the colors for the exterior of our house, pink trim and all, and it went up. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you very much for everything, Lord. Please give us strength to overcome this COVID-19 pandemic. And please bless all the people around the world and give them opportunity to follow you, Lord. Please forgive us our, forgive us our sin. We pray in the name of our Savior Christ. Amen. over me. 
Normally at this time during our assembly, we would be devoting our attention towards the Lord's Supper. We'd be gathered together as a family uh, physically, and we would pass around the element of the unleavened bread that would represent Christ's body, and we'd then pass around the element called the fruit of the vine or grape juice that represents Christ's blood. But during this present circumstance, we're not able to assemble. But we can do so in spirit, and we can gather together here virtually, uh, together as one body in Christ, and do the best we can to remember Christ's death. Many times the Apostle Paul was traveling or otherwise could not assemble with the saints on the first day of the week as he would like to, and he had to do the best he can, just as we do today. So at this time, I want to focus our attention upon what our Savior's done for us. We live in a time where there are many threats to our physical well-being, and this coronavirus is the number one on the top of the list as far as things getting our attention that are fearful. But in Jesus Christ, despite fears of attack upon our physical body or health in some way being jeopardized, we know that through his sacrifice that nothing can touch our soul. And even though we may die or experience a hardship or affliction or even poor health in some way, our soul, our inner being can be at home with the Lord and we can live without fear. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 addressed this with these words. In verse 37 he says, Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. At times we might be separated from our health or our financial well-being or from friends or family, but the one thing that cannot ever be touched is our security through Jesus Christ through his sacrificial death for us. So this time we're going to spend a short period of reflection upon the death of Christ and remember his body which 
hung on the cross as a sacrifice for us and his blood that was shed that represents a life that was given for our life. And may we do this in a profound reflection upon the greatest things that he's addressed in our life that can never, ever be taken from us. Let's pray at this time. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for the gift of your Son, and we know today that we live because of him. And as we reflect upon his life and his eventual death, we know that his death was according to your purpose, that we might be liberated from uh, the prison of sin that we uh, put ourselves in through our own choices, and that we can live today knowing we are free of sin and the charge of guilt, and that we are secure with you no matter what happens in this life as we remain faithful to us or to you. May, Father, you help us to focus at this time upon your son's death, but at all times as well. This we pray through your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey church, uh, this is the time of the service that we want to give you an opportunity to give to support the work here at Lake Merced. Obviously, the, the, everything that we do here has a cost, and so we want to ask and give you an opportunity to give to support that cost. We know times are tough right now. We know people are losing their jobs. Uh, but if, if God so moves you, if you'd prayerfully consider giving to support the work here at Lake Merced, we would be honored and we'd be blessed by that. Uh, two ways that you can give. If you go to our website, lakemercedchurch.com, go up there to the top right hand corner and click giving. Uh, you'll have an opportunity there to fill in all the little boxes and hit submit and you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Uh, we like to do a recurring gift. Secondarily, if you have your phone out, you can pull that out and you can, you can text in a dollar amount, 25, 250, whatever you want to do, to 84321. Again, that's a dollar amount, text it to the number 84321. You'll get a text right back that will give you all the instructions that you need to set up your, your gift to us there. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, to bless us and bless the work and bless those who may be in need in weeks to come. I pray that you will. We ask that you would just go to God in prayer and, and let him give you wisdom about that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I lift your name. 
Hey, good morning, and welcome to the services here at the Lake Merced Church of Christ in beautiful San Francisco. It's a pleasure to be outside. It's a pleasure to, to honor and celebrate Mother's Day with you all this morning. Uh, if you've been with us at all these, these past couple of weeks, then you know that we've been in a series that we're calling Captive, which is really just a, a look at the intersection of our own shelter in place here in the midst of this global pandemic and looking at it through the lens of scripture, uh, trying to understand Israel's captivity in the nation of Babylon and how that intersects what we're dealing with here today. Uh, we're going to take a break from that series this week uh, because we want to tell a different kind of story right now. And so this week we're rewinding. We're going back to, to King number three in Israel's history. This is the son of King David. This is King Solomon, the, the one from whom several of our Old Testament books are attributed to. We think of Proverbs, we think of Song of Solomon. Of course, my personal favorite is the, the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, according to the, the biblical account of who King Solomon was, he's portrayed as one of the wisest men who ever lived, ever. So it should come as no surprise that those three books that I just mentioned are generally referred to as the wisdom literature. Uh, it's an acknowledgement that it's, it's kind of a different kind of writing style than a lot of the historical books or the books of poetry like the Psalms or even the prophets. It, Solomon's writings kind of get their own category. And so way back in 1 Kings chapter 3 in your Bibles, we get the account of Solomon, and he's, he's assuming the throne as king over Israel. He's taken over for his father, King David, and we see this king portrayed as, as generally a good king. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, the verse says, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David. He's walking with the Lord. And then a couple of verses later, we read about how God approached Solomon in a dream. And he said, hey, Solomon, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Think about that. It was kind of like a, a genie type moment from God. Like Solomon, you get one wish. <laughs> what is it? But Solomon does something fascinating with God's invitation. He doesn't ask for wealth or fame, or power. He doesn't ask for any of the things that you'd expect a person to ask for in a moment like that, where the God of all that is invites you to ask for whatever you want. Instead, what does Solomon ask for? He says, I'm only a child who does not know how to carry out my duties. He's talking about as king. Like, don't we wish all of our leaders had enough perspective of themselves to say words like that. And so here's what he asks for. He says, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, to distinguish between right and wrong. He says, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? So think about it. what is he asking for? Essentially, it's, it's wisdom and it's discernment. He's saying like, help me choose between right and between wrong as king. I need help with that God. And so we read about how God is, is so pleased with Solomon's request. Like he not only grants him wisdom, but he grants him wealth and he gives him power as well. Like so amazing was Solomon's wisdom that, that seven chapters later in chapter 10, the queen of Sheba travels a long distance just to come and talk to him. To, to tell him what was on her mind, to help process whatever she was thinking about in that moment. It's like that question of, like, who would you choose to have dinner with if you could eat with anyone in the world? Well, she chose Solomon. Now, this may seem like a strange story to begin to tell on Mother's Day, and, and I'm going to tell you, I don't think it is. And so this morning, I'm, I'm excited to tell you why. So it's no surprise, today's Mother's Day, and since 1908, it's been a day that has been important to the moms of our lives for a long, long time. It's important to those who have given it all, to those who've laid it down, to those who've grown us and raised us. And so here at Lake Merced, we love and we honor and we revere 
the moms among us. Uh, like you, I have a mom. Her name is Lori. She's probably watching right now, and I'm here to tell you she's a great mom. She's, she's loved me through the best of times and the worst of times. She's, she has loved me in my most unlovable moments. Like you've, you've heard that saying before, a, a face only a mother could love. Well, sometimes that was my face. You might be thinking it still is, in which case, fine. But I'm also blessed to, to call other moms, other people moms of my life, uh, and, and, and to be blessed by them. I think of my stepmom, Elaine, who's been a part of my life for the last 22 plus years, or my mother-in-law, Lois, who's been a part of my life for the last 19 plus years. And, and last, but certainly not least, the mom of my kids, my, my beautiful wife, Tiffany, who's walked through thick and thin with me, and she's been a mom in our family for the last 13 years. Like, I, I can't begin to tell you how much those four women have meant to me. And the reality is that I don't, I don't need to because I know that you probably have a mom or moms in your life who've meant as much to you as mine have for me. And so this morning I want to do something that's going to sound perhaps a little shocking, uh, something that's probably pretty unorthodox. <laughs> I'm going to share a story of the incredible beauty of moms by telling you a story about two prostitutes. If you know the story, this may not shock you in the slightest, and if you don't, you're probably scratching your head right now thinking, why? Because probably like, like you, my mom doesn't really appear to have anything in common with their story or their lives. And neither does my stepmom, <clears throat> neither does my mother-in-law, neither does my wife. And yet there's a, a subtle beauty to the story that I, I hope we don't overlook. So open your Bibles if you would, or your favorite Bible app if you're on a, a, a tablet or a phone. And I'd love to invite you to read along with me. We're going to be in, in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 16. Now, the, the story that I'm about to read comes right on the heels of King Solomon's notable request of God for wisdom and discernment. And as the, the rest of the chapter draws to a close, the Bible throws in this, this little anecdotal story as a way to illustrate this, this newfound wisdom and discernment that God had just granted the new king. So I want to invite you to read along with me. Like I said, we're going to be getting in verse 16. And here's what the text says. It says, Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, Pardon me, my lord. This woman and I live in the same house. And I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. And during the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. And then the next morning I got up to nurse my son and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it, it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, no, the living one is my son. The dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours. The living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. And the king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead. Well, that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. So then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king and he then gave an order. He said, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. 
Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Now, this is an interesting story, isn't it? In fact, we, we see similar stories throughout ancient cultural texts, and we even have modern day parodies of this story as well being made to this day. Uh, the, the TV show Seinfeld, for instance, did an episode where, where Kramer and Lois were bickering about who had the rights to a particular bike. Uh, and so it was suggested that they cut the bike in half. And so Lois agreed with that. She thought that was a great idea, but Kramer said, I, I don't want to see any harm come to this beloved bike. So naturally the, the bike was Kramer's. And at first glance, like this is an odd story. As a Mother's Day story, this is an odd story. It's a story about prostitutes. This is an odd story. I get all of that. But I also kind of love this story for those reasons, because motherhood isn't always comprised of those nice, clean-cut stories depicted in Disney fairy tales or as part of the, the American dream. We, we all know the American dream, right? It's that, that life where, where man and wife save themselves for marriage and they have three kids and they have a dog and they raise their kids in suburbia with a, a beautiful white picket fence and a nice green lawn and well, everyone lives happily ever after, naturally. And so that's the version of motherhood that we prop up as the, the very definition. And yet in our midst is a, a pat, patchwork quilt of stories of, of single moms and widowed moms and abused moms and trafficked moms, military moms, sick moms. And so I don't, I don't in any way mean to disparage the, the motherhood I described a moment ago. That's awesome. But I also recognize that that isn't everyone's reality. And so I think the story in 1 Kings kind of captures the essence of that truth in a, in a surprising way, in an effective way, in a powerful way. Like, make no mistake, this is a story whose main purpose is, is designed to depict the wisdom of King Solomon. And yet, below the surface, it, it reveals some powerful and special things about motherhood and about how God created moms, how he wired them, that I think needs our attention this morning, that I think we benefit from. And so I want to share three of those with you. And I share them with the caveat that I recognize that these are not universal truths with a capital T. Like there are women who feel very different to what I'm about to say, and that's, that's quite all right. But I also want to honor some things that are often true. Uh, the first is, is the innate desire for motherhood. The innate desire for motherhood. You know, at the, at the heart of verse 22 of what we just read, there's this dispute among two women who want this baby to be theirs, who desire to be moms. And so as you read commentary and you read articles about this passage, there's often this portrayal of like one mom is evil and the other mom is good. Like, make no mistake, I mean, the actions of, of one of those moms were, were evil actions. But consider what's at the heart of how she's behaving. What's at the heart of it is really just a, a desire to be a mom. And, and I can't just tell you firsthand, or I, I can tell you firsthand, rather, that, that as Tiffany and I decided to, to start having kids 13 years ago, we, we both wanted them. But there was something deeper about that desire in my wife, in her, than there was for me. It was kind of as if in that season, that was what God had purposed within her. Like it burned within her. And I'll never forget that day on April 1st, 2005, it was her birthday, when she wept with joy in the bathroom because her desire for motherhood would be realized. Like both of these women desired motherhood. Not every mother does, and I fully recognize that, yet there's something special that God places in the heart of so many women that is, is completely intangible. The second one is this. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a mother's deep knowledge of their child. We see that depicted in this story. Like nothing is more intimate than the relationship between a mother who, who grew another human being in their body 
Like a mother has felt every kick, every hiccup, every tantrum, everything. She felt it all. And, and the very first instinct that God created as life enters the world is to bond with and get their, their very sustenance from their mom, to nurse. And so sure enough here in verse 21, how did the rightful mother realize the deception? The text says, the next morning, I got up to nurse my son and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. You know, it may seem obvious that a mother would know her young, but I want you to think of how much we take that instinct for granted. The, the rightful mother could look at her child and she knew right away that this wasn't her son because of, of a mother's deep knowledge of their child. And, and I think that's special. And finally, number three is this. It's a, it's a sacrificial love that only a mother has, the sacrificial love of a mother. Like this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is what the story is built on at its core. That when Solomon summoned his swordsmen into the room with the order to, to cut the baby in two, it clearly wasn't with the intention of actually cutting the baby in two. It was, it was a sifting mechanism. It was, it was a way to differentiate one from the other. Like how do I differentiate between who loves this child selflessly as a, as a real mom would, and who's being selfish, who's looking out only for their own desires. You see, Solomon knew that the well-being of the child was threatened, or that when it was threatened, the, that, that selfless love of a true mother would reveal itself in that moment. And I think that's, that's really the beauty of this passage. Like, what did Solomon glean what did he gain from his request for, for wisdom and discernment from God? It, it wasn't just a, a creative ability to settle disputes. No, what, what God so powerfully demonstrated through him and in him that day was the unrivaled, unparalleled, exceptional love of a mother. Like the, the kind of love that, that naturally puts the well-being of the child above her very self. And I, I can only tell you a, as a dad that that is not true for all parents. Like I, I love my kids. I am head over heels in love with my kids. And yet when they were born, the, those first few minutes, if I'm being honest, they were strangers to me. I didn't have that initial bond that so many people romanticize about. Like for a short period of time, they could have been anyone's kids. Like they were cool, but I didn't, I didn't have that bond to them. But for my wife, man, that bond was there immediately. That, that selfless, I wouldn't say not just ability, but that selfless instinct had already taken root to the core of who she was. And man, it was just different for her. She would, she would never be the same person again. And I, and I mean that in the most beautifully sincere way. When you survey the biblical account of motherhood, like you see this pattern emerge time after time after time. Think of Jochebed, the, the mother of Moses. She knew that the thing that she, she could do to protect her son, the only thing that she could do to protect her son was to put him in a basket and leave him down by the river. Or you think of Rahab who placed her family's safety above all else. She brought in these spies into her home. Or you think of Hannah who put her son Samuel's calling as a, a prophet above all else, above her own desire for him. And she, she brought him to the temple to work and she rejoiced. And like that list goes on and on and on. We read story after story after story of this selfish, sacrificial love of a mother. We see it in Naomi. We see it in Elizabeth. We see it in Mary. Like it's real. It is tangible. And man, it's, it's different for most moms than it is for dads. I, I really, really believe that. You know, shortly before we had kids of our own, our small group at church would get together once a month with another small group. And we'd, we'd have a party, we'd have food and play games and all that good stuff. And I'll never forget one of those parties when we walked in and our friends accidentally let their two big Labrador dogs into the house with, you know, 20 or 30 people there. 
Like for almost everybody there, that's not a big deal. But for this one pregnant mom, I'll never forget the moment when, when everyone's head turned and looked at her and she screamed and she grabbed her be belly and she suddenly yelled like, my baby. And instantly she jumped onto the kitchen counter to safety. Safety from these two dogs that probably just wanted to come in and lick her. Like we all laughed because it looked a little bit ridiculous. And yet I look back now and I see it differently than I did then. Because what I see now is the instinct of a mom who sacrificially loves and desires to protect their child from, from any and every source of harm, whatever it is. And so that's why the words I'm about to share were so meaningful to me this week. I read an article from a mom about how sacrificial motherhood truly is. And it's touching and it resonated with me to the core because I see it in my own wife. She said, you know, being a mom is the ultimate sacrifice. She said, you give up your body for nine months to grow this little baby. You go through labor and delivery. You go through emotions that come with childbirth. You let go of, of all shame as you walk around your house in diapers and you ask your significant other to, to spray warm water on your rip while you pee to avoid that burn. She said, you spend tireless hours latching your baby and feeding your baby to establish and keep up your milk supply because you want to breastfeed just so dang bad. She said, you, you remain patient through leaps and growth spurts and cluster feeding. But most importantly, she said, moms give up who they were before they were mothers. Most moms give up a lot of their hobbies and, and dreams and plans. Moms put their lives on hold so their babies can live out their life. And she said, we, we deal with so many emotions that we internalize just so we can be mothers to our babies. Don't ever discredit a mother. You don't know the half. I used to be Autumn, fun loving, crazy, outgoing Autumn, but now I'm Layla's mama and I'm okay with that. Those are the words of the author, Autumn Benjamin. But those are sentiments and the reality of just about every mom I know. Guys, that, that love is special. That love is unique. That love is, is real. You know, Jesus said something powerful about love to his disciples. He gave them a command in John chapter 15. He said, love each other as I have loved you. In the very next verse, he foreshadowed his own love for them, his own sacrifice with, with a powerful statement in verse 13. He said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Greater love. You know, Jesus may be talking about his own love for them, but it's that kind of love, that, that willingness to lay down your very life that I think is present in, in most parents, but I believe is, is most obviously seen in the love of a mom, but the love that unwillingly, or that willingly rather, and joyfully gives up who they were and what their identity was prior to kids. Like it's, it's that kind of mom or that kind of love that makes a pregnant woman jump on kitchen counters or, or tirelessly work three jobs or even pawn off their most valuable possessions just to make ends meet. Like that was the love that one woman showed before King Solomon that day, a, a love that would stop at nothing, and I mean nothing, to protect their child. You know, church, uh, friends, whoever may be listening this morning, wherever you might be, what I want you to see and what I hope you hear this morning is that the love that we honor and celebrate in moms isn't a love that's unique to them specifically. Rather, it's a love that they were designed to reflect. The, the love that we value, the love that we cherish, the love that we, we so richly see in a mom is the same love 
that God showers us, us with as his children. It's, it's that love that puts everything else first, that puts everything else first. And so to the, to the moms who are listening right now, to the moms who have enriched my life, I personally say thank you. Like not only have you taught us what love is, but you've revealed the, the very love of God to us in the process. And you did, likely didn't even know it. Like you are living out the very image of God's love for humanity in every single act of selfless love that you display. And, and in so doing, you are revealing the power of God's word in John 3.16, where God says, for God, or the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You, you think about it, God pawned off his one and only son to purchase us all. Like the love of a mother is special and it reflects the perfect love of our Heavenly Father. And so while we honor moms this morning, absolutely, we do so because they have served so beautifully as the conduit for God's love for us. Friends, I don't, I don't know who you are or where you are this morning as you listen to this, but I know this much. God loves you with that, that same sacrificial love of a mom, God loves you and he will do anything for you. He will stop at nothing for you. The Bible says that God is love. He's the, the very definition of love. As we continue the shelter in place as a community, you might be feeling the weight of all this right now. And, and I want to remind you of that, that God is love. That God, he loves you so much. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is madly in love with you. And so if you've not received him into your life, if you've not received Jesus into your life, I want to invite you to that today. Because Jesus laid it all on the line so that you could live and be with him. And so if, if you're interested this morning in receiving God's love and his grace into your life, I, I want to invite you to that. If, you would, if you'd email us at, at questions at lakemercedchurch.com, man, I would love to talk with you more about what, who God is, what he's doing, and how much he loves you. And, and friends, I, I, I pray that you will. To our moms out there, man, happy Mother's Day. Thank you so much for everything you've meant to us, for loving us like you do. God bless you, my friends. Thanks for being with us. Happy Mother's Day from all of us here at Lake Merced Church of Christ in beautiful San Francisco. We're so glad you're here. God bless you. Stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change. This one thing remains, this one thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love, your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid This one thing remains Your love 
never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love, your love in death and life. I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. This one thing remains. This one thing remains. I really appreciated Josh's inspiring message on this Mother's Day, reminding us of how the love of a mother reflects the love of God, as, as so many things do, but that particular kind of love reflects the love of God in a very special way. Whether we're talking about a mother by birth, or a mother by adoption, or a mother by circumstance, or a mother who is won simply by the fact of her influence over those around her. It's not by coincidence, I think, that Jesus, in referring to his own love, even for those who rejected him, used the figure of a mother to describe that love. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, in the 37th verse, we find Jesus saying this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those who sent, were sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. A powerful thought there that even those who turned against God, who turned against his son and turned against the messengers that God sent, Jesus wanted to embrace them as a loving mother embraces her children. What a powerful thought for us to reflect on on this Mother's Day. As we close our service, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your love for us. A love so great and powerful and overwhelming that we can't begin to understand it. But we thank you that you've given us the means of looking at ourselves and our relationships and the world around us and finding parallels for that love. And on this Mother's Day, Father, we thank you particularly for the parallel of a mother's love for her children that reflects the greatness and the depth and the richness of your love for us. Father, as we go through this coming week, even in the midst of the difficult circumstances in which we are all living, as we live under the shelter in place circumstances and many of us are sequestered in our homes, Father, we just ask that you would help us to look within ourselves to find that love that you have placed there in order that we might reflect that love to those around us and whatever opportunities that we have and in whatever circumstances that we find. Father, we just ask that you would continue to be with and bless our families, our loved ones, our communities, our country, and the world, Father, as we struggle through the pandemic that we are living through. We ask, Father, particularly for your blessings on those who are first responders who are working in the healthcare industry and those who are at risk because of the essential services that they provide to the, the communities in which they live. Father, just bless them and bless us all as we, as we strive to stay safe and to keep one another uplifted and encouraged in these difficult times. 
Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much that no matter how difficult things are, we can look to you and know that you embrace us as a loving mother or father embraces their children. And we thank you that your love is always there for us to strengthen us, to guide us, and to shine through us so that we, by our example, can guide others to you. Father, bless us this week. Bless us always. In Jesus' name, amen. To all of our moms and our grandmas and our great-grandmas, I don't know if we have any great-great-grandmas, but if you're there, you too, uh, happy Mother's Day. I, I pray and I hope that today is a special day for you, a day where you are honored and you are cherished and you are called and you are FaceTimed and you just get to get loved on. I know these are the, the worst kind of circumstances for Mother's Day, and yet I pray that God finds a way to bless you richly today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this Mother's Day sermon. I pray that you know a little bit more, especially if you're a mom, about how your love is, is really rooted in who God is and how we all as, a, as humanity get to enjoy the fruits of that kind of love. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that your week is blessed. We'll see you next week. If you would, go ahead and click share for us one more time. God bless you. We'll see you next time.